introduce a little bit about data society. So this is a customer success led webinar series. So we're aiming to uh, advocate Tableau data culture and also the helping users to improve Tableau skill set to utilize their uh, the Tableau value. And so today, as the first start of the webinar um, uh, in, the, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, so I'm very happy uh, to invite our twin Tableau and Masters, or in today's word is actually Tableau visionaries in the community to share uh, their a session so it's a little obscure a little random and little uh, a lot useful not a little, little useful a lot useful uh, for tableau technique technique so um i'm not so sure if everybody understand about the tableau uh, zen master or visionary uh, let me just spend a little time to introduce you about uh, this term but first of all i just want to uh, uh, congratulate uh, the 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 flourish uh, the fl flourish Twins Ken and Kevin. Um, unfortunately, they are not able to see. Uh, you're not able to see to see their handsome faces because the security reason. I didn't set up cor uh, properly. So hopefully next time you will see their face when they do the uh, real time presenting. Um, just uh, uh, congratulate them. Uh, they have been successfully re-elected as Tableau visionary. So visionaries used to be uh, used to called as Tableau and master. So those other persons, there are uh, 65 globally, so that they are the master of the Tableau platform, and then they share their experiences generously with a wide community globally. And also, they also help Tableau to build better products. Uh, they have been recognized by, uh, by their contributions and nominated by the community as well. So very representative, uh, well represent uh, the diverse skill set background and also the interest from all around the world um, so uh, let me share with you uh sent you their uh their links of uh their uh, their website and also the uh, tableau public profile later but i would say this is the fourth year for ken's uh fourth term of tableau uh, visionary and this year should be ken's third year if i'm not wrong i'm just uh, um just uh, based on my memory yeah so and also they are the only uh tableau twin uh, visionary uh, within the community. So uh, let me just share with you, uh, before I, sh uh, I introduce you uh, uh, them individually, I just want to show you that how they are very look alike. Um, before the sharing started, be before the sharing started, and they were talking about who is who, and even uh, when they grown up, and also uh, w w when they just get married, moved into a different city, and they started to use their Tableau. So they really did a lot of contributions to this community. So if you look at, uh, um, I'm going to share it with you this link as well. They have a beautiful and well-established, uh, well-maintained uh, uh, website as well. So it really contains the information, knowledges from the beginning to the uh, advanced Tableau users. <clears throat> so this website is actually one of our top recommendations from our customer success globally to our customers as well. And so uh, those are their profiles. Um, as I said, I'm going to share with you uh, later uh, in the chat window. And so uh, just to uh, in introduce about themselves, uh, Ken uh, is, has 20 years of experiences in IT and he's a truly data evangelist. And um, I think Kevin's Tableau knowledge is actually initially, initially introduced by, by Ken. And currently he's the uh, assistant director of data analytics at uh, 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 Bucknell University, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, and where he represent, he uh, resp he's responsible in architecture, designing, and also the development of the uh, uh, enterprise data and analytics uh, solutions. So for, uh, for Kevin, uh, he has 15 years of ex uh, professional experience in data analytics and uh, genu genuinely passionate in about data. So he's the senior uh, analyst and also the Tableau developer at Unifund. So this is the, the company <clears throat> co-created by a few Tableau and Masters as well. And just uh, something about for, for, for his achievement in Tableau, uh, he has four Iron V's top 10 uh, finishes and then the fourth most favorite uh, authors in Tableau public. So I believe their title, um, uh, their, their, the, the titles they have contributed in the, in the, uh, in the, in the website is actually taller than my height. Okay, so without further ado, I will pass my presentation to uh, Ken and Kevin just to share their best practices, how to help you to improve your Tableau skills. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. 
And it okay? Yes. All right, and you hear me fine? I know yes. you can't see me, unfortunately, but yeah. uh, you get to see the picture yeah. of me. So just imagine my mouth moving. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for having us. I, I, I will warn you, I think maybe I sent you some outdated information. So some, some of that has changed. Uh, yes. Ken, Ken is uh, title, both of our titles have changed. We both took promotions since since then. And, uh, I, and, and Ken, yeah, Ken is on his fifth year as a, I didn't update this slide, but as a visionary or what they used to call Zen master, and I'm on my third year. So yes, and you are correct. Ken did uh, introduce me uh, to, to Tableau. So uh, just a little, I, you, you did a great job of introducing us, but a little bit uh, about us, our own introduction. Since you can't see our faces, you can see some caricatures of our faces. So that's me on the left and Ken on the right. And I'm gonna move you guys out of the way. And uh, we operate the website Flourless Twins. You did a great job of introducing that. We have, I think, in the neighborhood of 320 blog posts on that website. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. We put about put out a uh, blog post pretty much every week. Um, we are identical twins, so people always want to know how alike are we. You know, you saw some pictures of us, and when we were younger, we did look pretty much identical. And and if we were talking earlier before we got started, Ken and I can't even tell us apart in a lot of those pictures. But how alike are we? Well, we can kind of dig into the data. We can look at where we live. So I live in, we both live in the United States, and I live in a place called Burlington, Kentucky. It's, it's about 20 minutes outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, probably maybe the 15th largest city in, in the U.S. And then Ken, he lives and he uh, he moved to Williamsport, Pennsylvania about 20 years ago for a girl. And he, that is about 20 minutes outside of absolutely nothing. There's nothing there at all. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what we like to visualize, uh, Ken likes to uh, visualize serious topics most of the time. Things like religion, armed conflict. Uh, endangered species and politics, where I like to tackle the really hard-hitting subjects like Adam Sandler, <laughs> video games, uh, cartoons, and famous hot dog eating competitions. Um, if you're not aware, this happens at uh, the, the 4th of July every year in the United States and New York. And uh, this guy right here, this guy, Kobayashi, he used to be the champ, but then this guy came along and I think last year he ate like 75 hot dogs and buns in 10 minutes. So pretty crazy awesome. silliness that I like to create a viz about that. But who's the best, right? Who always want, everybody wants to always know who's the best at this data visualization stuff, that who's the best at Tableau. Well, we can use some data to figure that out. This is a, a viz from Josh Tapley, who scraped Tableau Public, and it's called Cerebro. And one of the things he looks at is the number of followers on Tableau Public. So we look at this, um, we always see Andy Kreeble at the top of that list. Uh, you see at me at number three and Ken a distant fourth. So shameful, Ken, shameful. And then we could look at number of favorites on Tableau Public. Who has the most favorites of all time? Who's the second, who's the third? Um, well, Andy Kreeble, again, at the top of the list, I'm in second, Ken, again, distant third. So pretty, pretty bad, Ken. Um, truth is, I mentioned it before, um, Ken, Ken was a Zen master before I even downloaded Tableau. He was a DBA for, I don't know, 10 years, and uh, he's really, really good at this stuff. So uh, I'll give Ken kudos. He is probably better than me at this stuff. <laughs> Well, we kind of all went through this before with Zen Masters, we're identical twins. Um, da, 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 da. So today, today we're going to be talking uh, a, a little obscure, a little random, and a lot used <clears throat> Tableau techniques, probably the longest title of any presentation we've ever given. Um, really, it's just about different techniques. Some of them might be obscure or, or, or what seem to be random, uh, and they certainly are underutilized or, and, and sometimes not even known. But they're really, really useful. They're things that we use pretty much every single day. There are certain techniques I'm going to talk about today that I use in every single visualization that I create, whether it's for fun or for work. So we're going to talk about four different generalized use cases and, or te techniques, and we'll kind of go through numerous use cases for each. Um, 
no reason to take notes. I, I mean, I believe this is being recorded, but you can also get to all these different blog posts that are going to talk about all these different tips, all these different techniques at flourishtwins.com slash techniques. And um, I say we just get to it. I am going to pass it over to you, Ken, to get us started. All right. Thanks, Kev. I think I need to. Yep. All right. Um, so, can you hear me okay? Sure yes. can. All right. Uh, so, I, I've got just sort of two sections here of tips that I'm, I'm going to cover. This, this first section are things I call hidden in plain sight. So, so these are some techniques that um, I really just learned pretty recently, and uh, but they're they're really easy to execute and really powerful. And I just want to make sure everyone knows how to do these because inevitably you're going to run into some of these problems as you're, as you're working with Tableau. Um, and then my second section, I'll focus on the order of operations and I'll explain that a little bit more when I get to it. So um, my first tip is about hiding marks. So here we have a line chart. And what I've wanted to do here is to highlight the maximum value and the minimum value. Uh, with just slightly different colors. So to do this, uh, what I've done is I've created a calculated field like this. Now, don't worry too much about what this is doing, but basically it's just looking to see if uh, each of the, if this point is the minimum amount, uh, minimum value, the max, or, or something else, you know, neither, neither of those. Um, and then what I do is I create another calculated field that says, basically, if it's not neither. So if it's the min or the max, then give me the sales amount. Then I use a, a dual axis here. You can see my second axis. I change that to a circle mark and I put the high, low, that first calculated field on color. And then I'm able to sort of control the color of these marks like that. Um, that works. That works pretty well in this case, um, but there's a, a little bit easier way to do it, and, and that's just by using the hide marks feature. And, I, and like I said, I just learned this and didn't realize you could do this until very recently. So to, for starters, instead of doing that, that's, we don't need this second calculation at all. We can just do a dual axis with just sales. Again, we have that high low on the color, car, color uh, card. But you see, we get these marks for each of these individual ones, right? And we just want to hide these gray marks. We just want the marks for the, the, the blue and the red. So all we have to do is go to the legend, right click on that item we don't want, choose hide, and it goes away. Super simple. Um, now, something like this, creating this line chart, it, that other method wasn't all that hard. It wasn't overly difficult. But there are some techniques, particularly when you get into things like drawing curves or some sort of crazy chart types, uh, where that hiding of the marks is just just makes your life a lot easier than trying to, to deal with, um, you know, the complex math and things like that that come into play with, with curves. Uh, once you've hidden these, you can turn them back on by going to analysis and reveal hidden data and they can come right. So just always remember that that clicking on the legend and hiding a mark can come in handy uh, at certain times. The second uh, technique here I want to show is is using a discrete field for a uh, highlight table. So here I have a highlight table that's showing uh, my different uh, segments as well as sub subcategories, and I'm showing the profit ratios here in this chart. Uh, and what I've done is I wanna highlight the top two profit ratios, starting with a dark blue for the top and then a light blue for the next. And then I wanna highlight the bottom two profit ratios, again, a dark orange and a lighter orange. Um, so I just wanna sort of walk through, you know, sort of how I would approach this in my own mind. And you can see the problems that I kind of run into as I'm trying to do this. So the way I would start off by approaching this, I would do a, um, create a field for, for rank of that profit ratio for starters. And then I would create a calculated field that looks kind of like this. Basically saying, uh, I'm hard coding some things, don't worry about that. But basically I'm bringing back whether it's the top one, top two, bottom two, bottom one, or sort of none of the above, right? So just text that I can use to color these marks. So what I would then do is drag that to color. It colors the text, we don't want that. So I'm gonna change the mark type to square and 
kind of starting to see what we want, right? But these these squares are too small, so I increase the size, and uh, you get these squares that just sort of overlap each other. You don't know what color goes with what, and so that clearly doesn't work, right? So historically, my approach to this has been to use a continuous field, a, a green pill, and essentially for this. So instead of that, uh, instead of this field that brings back text, I would create something like this that brings back a numeric value. So ranging from two to negative two, you know, my top, uh, my, my highest ratio would be two, my lowest profit ratio would be negative two, everything else is zero, right? So we've got, you know, that, that nice center point of zero. So I then bring that over to the color card, change it to square, and then we get this, uh, because this is a continuous field, we get this uh, diverging color palette. So I can click on color, edit that, and change this to, I always have trouble finding this one, orange, blue, white diverging. White is in the middle, and that's gonna be that zero point. So that's gonna make all these zeros sort of look like they're not highlighted. And then we get this nice highlighting uh, effect that we want. Um, that works, but it's kind of painful, right? You know, if I wanted to say change this light blue color to pink or something like that, well, I have to actually go and create a custom diverging color palette to handle that. It would be nice if I could just individually change these colors to suit my needs. Um, and there's a trick that makes this a little bit easier. So I'm going to once again take my discrete pill, drop it on color, just like we did before, change this to square increase the size. Again, we have this overlap problem, but there's a really cool and simple, easy technique for, for eliminating this. So I'm just going to double click in the columns shelf and create an inline calculation. Just two quotes, just an empty string like this. And then I'm going to control and drag that down to rows as well. And then I'm just going to right click this and hide those headers so that they're visible. And if we increase the size of this a little bit, you can see these boxes are all sort of staying in their own place now, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, if I click color, I see each of these discrete color fields. I can change none to white so that those go back to the background. And then I can individually change these as well. So I said about I, that I wanted to change this light blue to pink. All I have to do is select that, change it to pink. And now I have this highlight table working exactly the way I want with a discrete pill on that color. Um, this is something I always wanted to do. I just learned about this maybe about a year ago. So I definitely want everyone to know how to do this little trick. Um, so let me shift gears a little bit. I'm gonna talk about something that's maybe a little bit more technical and that's the order of operations. Um, and really, you know, I'm gonna talk about how we can take this and sort of bend it to our will to make Tableau do things we want in the order that we want it. Uh, so in my opinion, the order of operations is, is a critical piece of knowledge that anyone using Tableau really needs to understand um, in order to get really good at, at using the product. You're gonna, as you're, as you're using the product, you're gonna run into these, these order of operations problems all the time and, and being able to go back to the order of operations and, and sort of trace what you're doing uh, is very helpful. That's, so that's kind of what we're gonna do here. Um, I'm gonna give you a handful of sort of common problems that we run into with the order of oper operations and show you how to fix them. So before we start that, let's talk about what the order of operations is. Uh, if you search for the Tableau order of operations, you'll see something like this and it, it just shows a, a a variety of different types of filters and calculations and the order in which they com compute. So the very first thing that computes is, is extract filters then data source filters, all the way down to the bottom, the last things that compute are, are trend lines and reference lines. So this is sort of this sequence of, of things that happen um, in, in a certain order. So the most common problem that I see people run into with order of operations is with fixed uh, level of detail calculations. Uh, so let me give you an example of that. Here I'm, I'm working with Superstore data and I'm showing my customer name and their first order date. So first order date is, is an um, LOD calculation that just fixes on the customer name and gets the min order date. So essentially it gives me the very first order that that customer made. Uh, this works great. I can see those order dates, but you know, inevitably I might want to be able to filter in and drill in on this a little bit more. So I've added a filter for category. You can see the filter over here. And uh, for, in for instance, I might want to see um, what's the first order date for technology, right? So I deselect 
furniture and office supplies. And even after changing that, none of these dates change. It's still showing the first order date. And this kind of thing is the first clue that I often see, uh, you know, that, that would often or sort of give me a clue that there's an order of operations problem. Um, so let's take a look at the order of operations and try to figure out what's going on here. Here's the order of operations and highlighted the operations that we're using here. So we can see it up here at the top is this fixed LLD. And then we can see that dimension filter. That's the filter that we've used here. So fixed LLDs compute before dimension filters. So if, if we think about what's happening here is Tableau is looking at the entire data set. It's computing that fixed LLD. It's looking at the entire data set, getting the minimum order uh, for each customer customer, and then it's applying the filter, right? So it's getting that minimum order date for the entire data and then chopping down the data set using that dimension filter. And what we really want is, is a little bit different. We want that filter to compute first and then get the minimum order date. So to do that, we can leverage context filters. So let's go back to our view. To change this filter to a context filter, we right click it, we choose add to context, at this point, we're still showing all the categories, so we still see the first, uh, same first order dates. But you'll see as I start to deselect these items that we're getting different order dates. Um, and again, that's because you know this context filter is applying first. It's I'm using my hands and talking as if you can see me, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it's condensing our data set to just that technology uh, category and then it's finding that first order date. So this is by and far the, the most common order of operations problem uh, I see. Um, the next one I see a lot is similar to this. It has to do with top uh, end filters. So what I have here is a list of customers, their rank, so the rank based on their sales and then their, their sales amount. Uh, and I'm showing the top 15 using a, a top end filter on uh, customers. So you can see I'm doing the top 15 customers by the sum of sales here, right? So these should be my, I'm, I'm showing all the years. So it should be my top 15 overall customers in the Superstore data set. Um, this is great, it works perfectly, but I might wanna be able to filter on the year and, and sort of, you know, maybe ask a question of, uh, you know, what are my, who are my top 15 customers for 2020? <laughs> Right, so I've added a filter on the year of order date and let's just deselect these and see our top 15 customers for 2020. Um, well, uh, it, I can pretty quickly see a couple of, of big problems here. Uh, one is that I'm not showing 15 customers, I'm only showing 14. I know that I have at least 15 customers in 2020, so something's not quite right. The other problem I see is that some of these numbers are really low. Like uh, this 14th largest customer only has $13 of sales. That seems that seems wrong. It, that just doesn't make sense. So again, that is a clue that there's an order of operations problem here. So let's take a look at our order of operations. Um, just like with the fixed LLD, our top end filter computes here, which happens, which occurs before dimension filters. So that year filter is a dimension filter. The top end filter is computing before that. So again, think about what this is doing. It's looking at the entire data set, grabbing the top 15 customers, and then after that, it's filtering. So what's happening that's causing us to only have 14 customers when we do this is it's looking at that entire, you know, the top 15 overall customers, and then we're filtering down to 2020 there's at least, there's one customer that is one of my top customers that actually has no sales in 2020. So they're getting dropped off that list. Um, this is confusing. I don't think this makes us a lot of sense for this analysis that we're doing. So we're gonna once again, leverage context filters to make this work the way we want. Um, so let's select all the years. Let's add year filter to context. And then as I change this to just 2020, we now have 15 total customers. These numbers seem more reasonable. Now I'm seeing just the top 15 customers for 2020. So again, those are, those are the two most common um, problems I see. Um, but what I'm gonna show you next, I've got a couple of tricks that are, that are sort of uh, 
you know, starting to bend the order of operations to our to my will, as if, as I said before, we're going to sort of force Tableau to calculate some things in the order that we need it. So this example I'm showing, um, I'm showing all the cities and states uh, in the U.S. that are buying uh, uh, products from Superstore. I've got a rank and I've got the total sale. So rank um, is, a, is a table calculation. It's just doing rank, uh, a sum of sales. Um, and uh, this works great. I can see you know, my top customer is New York City. Next is Los Angeles. I live in Pennsylvania, so I'm kind of interested in what's going on in Pennsylvania here. So Philadelphia is our top one. It's ranked fifth, fifth overall. And there's a couple other Pennsylvanias way down lower in this list. Um, but you know, as a Pennsylvania uh, person, I, I might actually want to be able to drill in and see you know, what's going on with Pennsylvania, right? So I added a filter on state. You can see that filter over here. And I can select Pennsylvania and see, uh, see the different cities that are buying from Superstore. So I can see Philadelphia and then some of these other ones. Um, but in this scenario, what I really want to see is that original sort of overall rank, right? So I can see Philadelphia as the top customer within Pennsylvania, but I want to know that Philadelphia was the fifth top customer in the whole country, right? So I'm running into this weird sort of order of operations where I really want to force that table calculation to compute at a different time or the filter, right? So again, let's go to the order of operations and see what's going on here. So that state filter is a dimension filter. You can see that here. And then we've got that rank, which is a table calculation. So the dimension filter is computing. It's filtering down all my data. It's you know, filtering it down to just Pennsylvania. And then it's doing the ranking. So I'm, it's always sort of reestablishing the ranking for just that data that I'm looking at. What I really want to do is force that filter to happen after the table calculation. So compute the table calculation on the entire data set and then filter down the data to just Pennsylvania. And to do that, I can leverage a table calc filter. So there's this really cool little trick. Let's show all of the states again. This really cool trick that I learned uh, from Pooja Gandhi, who was a former uh, Tableau visionary. Um, and it's this here, right? So we're gonna use this, this lookup function. And lookup just looks up a row, uh, either you know previous row in a partition or a sort of future row in, in a partition. So we're gonna either go up, you know, backward or forward. Um, in this case, I've used an offset of zero, which means we're not moving forward or backward. We're just taking the, the current record. And then I'm bringing back state. So essentially what this does is it just gives me the state of the row I'm on, but it's forcing this to act as a table calculation. So instead of the regular state filter, I'm gonna drag this state table calculation filter over, let's show everything, show this filter, I'm gonna change it to single value list and show all. And now I'm gonna choose Pennsylvania and watch what happens. When I do that, I now I'm maintaining those overall ranks. So I can see Philadelphia ranks fifth overall in the country and Altoona, even though it's what the uh, eighth ranked in, in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania, um, uh, it's actually 574th uh, in, in the country. I actually used to work at, in Altoona. So that's a good example for me, but uh, so very, very small customer overall within the country. So just to review, let's look back and see what's going on there, right? So what's happening is it's taking the entire data set, it's taking all those city and state pairs, it's ranking them in this table calculation, and then once they're ranked, it's using that table calc filter to filter down to just Pennsylvania, allowing me to maintain that, that overall rank. So this is a really useful trick, comes in very handy uh, a lot of different times. Um, one more sort of similar example to that is creating, uh, you know, a, a band like this, uh, a big, uh, has a couple, it, band means a couple of things. I'm just going to use the, the term big angry number, basically these big sort of uh, numbers that just give you a picture of what's going on. So this band here is showing my sales growth from 2019 to 2020. And I want to show you how to sort of trick the order of operations to create this for yourself. Um, so we might start by creating a table like this that has our year, our sales, and then what I've done is I've used a quick table calculation here 
to do the percent difference. So it's basically just calculating the percent difference of this sales amount to that sales amount. And what I want to do is just isolate this 20 so that I can make it big and, and, and uh, you know, angry, if you will. Right. So as I start to think through this logically, well, it seems like maybe I can just filter out 2019, right? And then that'll just leave me with this row. And then I just have to get rid of these two values. But what happens when I filter out 2019 is that difference goes away. And the reason is this dimension filter is, is removing 2019 out of it. And that table count can't compute without that 2019 data because it's doing a percent difference. Um, so we want to leverage the table calc filter again so that it happens after the table calculation. Um, but I'm going to do something a little bit different this time. I'm going to introduce this function called last. So what last does is it counts the number of rows uh, in the partition from the last record. So this in this table example, last is going to equal zero on this last row. It'll equal one on this one. If we had 2018, it would be equal two. So what I'm saying is if last equals zero, that's this row here, then give me true, otherwise false. I'm going to use that as a filter. Select true there. And because this is a table count filter, it's computing after the table calculation, so we don't lose our 20 value. I can now just hide this header, remove that sales measure, change this to entire view, increase the size, and now we have this nice little uh, band here that, that does exactly what we want. Oh, shoot. Uh, you know, I... I hate Kevin when I when I click on a, a band like this and I get this sort of big blue highlight. I really don't like that user experience for our users. I wish there was wish there was something we could do about that. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, order of operations, uh, very very powerful thing. You can do use it to to as I said, really bend Tableau to your will and make it do what you want it to do in the order of you want to do it. And, and I my opinion is that, you know, in order to really improve your skills with Tableau, learning and, and mastering the order of operations is really critical. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Kevin and he's gonna get a less, little less technical and show you some really, really cool stuff. All right, well done, Ken. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get a little less technical, but really, uh some handy stuff. Everybody see my screen, hear me okay? Yep. Everybody, yep, okay. All right, just making sure. All right, first thing I'm gonna talk about is some creative uses for navigation buttons. Now, navigation buttons came out in, I think, 2018 and were total game changers. We used to have to be really hacky on how we move from one dashboard to another, but now it's really easy. So what's some really just very simple standard use for a navigation button? Well, let's assume that we have a, a workbook with two different dashboards, scatter plot, bar chart, very um, aptly named, and we can just drag a navigation button onto the view. I'm just gonna float it for now. So we can, we have this navigation button, we can edit it, we can change it to an image so we can draw a button out. I'm just gonna leave it as text here. I'm gonna tell it to go to the chart, the worksheet bar charts, and we're just going to type in here bar chart, right? Okay, hit okay, leave the color the same. And now when I click this button, it goes to the bar chart. I can do the same thing to go back to the scatter plot. So we have this really nice navigation. We have to show tabs. Um, it's just a lot cleaner user experience. Now, I like to draw my own buttons, and uh, I mentioned that I don't like these sort of standard blocky buttons. So we we uh, we did this. We Ken and I just started playing in PowerPoint. Uh, this is actually a, a dashboard you can go to on my Tableau public page. You can download the the template in PowerPoint. These are all a bunch of buttons, a hundred in total, that you can download. You can change your text, you can change your color, your images, and then you can bring them in as navigation buttons in your uh, Tableau dashboard. We even have toggle buttons, kind of these. Um, new morphism buttons, so all kinds of uh, fun things. And like we said, we just drew these in PowerPoint. We're not great at Illustrator or anything like that. So you can download that and just save those and bring them in as your own images. Now, navigation buttons are great on their own that you can just navigate from one uh, dashboard to another, but they also have really other great uses. They can tell the user where you're at on a dashboard. So for example, this is a visualization I created 
back in 2019, looking at Major League Baseball. There are six divisions in Major League Baseball, three in the American League, three in the National League. So I didn't really have enough room to put all these on one dashboard. So I put them on six different dashboards, all in one workbook and six different dashboards. And I decided to just make the navigation really intuitive. So when you click, you obviously go to that particular um, division. It highlights that that button itself and the American League itself. I go to say National League Central, highlights National League. So it's really a very clear user experience of where uh, you are within the the, uh, the workbook. Now, my Cincinnati Reds, um, this is from 2019, but they've pretty much been in last place um, uh, every year since then. So forget about that. Uh, another cool little technique that I like, try and hit escape, is to use um, some minimize and maximizing buttons. So everybody knows how to use Windows where we can kind of click this and, and minimize and maximize Windows. Well, I like to do that in my Tableau dashboards. This is actually just an example. Um, this is another blog post I, I wrote about not kind of losing, eh, it doesn't matter. But we have, I had nine different examples here. And what I allow is for somebody to zoom in. So if I'm curious about what this one looks like, I can zoom in and I can zoom out. Now, that's a really, you know, kind of consistent feel with, with using Windows um, on, you know, that we've been using for years and years and years. And you can create that really easily um, using dashboard navigation buttons. Now, what I typically do to do this, we'll just demo it here, is I take the dashboard and I'm gonna duplicate that dashboard. And we're just gonna isolate one chart. Let's just isolate this corner chart here. So I'm just duplicating this dashboard and then I'm gonna get rid of all the stuff I don't want. And sorry that you have to watch me do that. All right. So now we have the main dashboard and then we have this other one that I want to zoom to. So really simple. All I'm going to do is add a navigation button here. Bring that up here. I'm going to change this to image button. I better go find this here. Presentations. Let's see where I put it probably in here. Oh boy, I should have been prepared for this, huh? Here we go. All right, so I've got this pop out button. I'm going to set it to navigate to min max demo two. All right, so I got this little pop out button. I'm not going to make it pretty. And then I'm going to come over to the second dashboard and I'm going to do the same thing navigation, edit button. We're going to go to min max demo one and image and the pop in button. Again, not gonna not gonna pretty it up at all. But now I have this really simple uh, expand and 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 de, de, uh, you know maximize and minimize button for a, a dashboard. We can do this for all our charts, or if we have just a specific one that we're interested in. I do this a lot of times with jit, small scatter plots or small jitter plots. I typically only do it once in a dashboard and not nine different times. Now, recently I came up with kind of a new technique of doing this. This has nothing to do, I'm gonna refresh this real quick. This has nothing to do with um, navigation buttons whatsoever, um, but this is just a trellis chart or small multiples, whatever you wanna call it. And I've devised a, a way using parameter actions to zoom in and zoom out of a chart uh, only in one sheet. So instead of duplicating the dashboard and doing this, you know, a dozen different times, uh, some parameter actions to zoom in and zoom out. Look for on Fleurledge Twins uh, in the next couple of weeks, I'll have a blog post about this. So probably a slightly better technique than duplicating the dashboard. But this is really low impact, really, really easy to do. Another cool use case, excuse me, I'm going to cough for one second. I got a little bit of a cold this week, so I'm sucking on cough drops trying to not cough, but it's inevitable. Uh, another really cool use case is a um, table of contents. So when the pandemic hit, my, my boss asked me to create a workbook on the unemployment rate in the United States. So I started exploring these different data sets and my dashboard that asked me to create ended up with 18 different dashboards and i was kind of in 
a conundrum of how do I allow users to navigate this dashboard? I could just make a simple table of context with text, but I thought it would be a lot more impactful to actually show what they might be seeing, right? So I created these 18 different dashboards and then I just took a snapshot of it to show you how we can do that. <coughs> we just go to dashboard, export image, and we can save that as a PNG. And then we can use these as navigation buttons. I'll, let me just demo how that might work. I might um, throw, let's just throw a horizontal container out here. I'm gonna throw a vertical in here and another vertical. Sorry, I've got a coughing fit all of a sudden. So now I have these uh, vertical containers inside of a horizontal container. I'm going to distribute them evenly. And then I'm going to just put these charts in here. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to add some navigation buttons in here. I'll come back to what I started to do here later. And I'm just dropping the navigation buttons in. And I'm not going to make this pretty for now, but... <coughs> Sorry, guys. And so now I'm just going to tell it to navigate to demo one. I'm going to pick the image and then I'm going to choose the picture of that dashboard. Same thing here. Image, choose the picture. That's demo TOC2. And I'm going to do all four of them. But you can see we start to have this sort of um, visual table of contents. And when I click on this, it goes to that dashboard. So really, really simple, really clean. This got a lot of um, feedback when I first created it and it's, um, it's worked out really, really well. Now, when you're looking at this, you may kind of start to wonder, I see this big spike here. That's when unemployment went crazy. And that was April of 2020. We are now almost two years past that. We're in March, 2022. So why do I see this big spike? Well, the big spike is because I simply took a screenshot of it two years ago and I use that as my button. Now I can manually go up and take different screenshots and change these images, or I can make this a dynamic table of contents by allowing these images to update with my data. So how might I do that? Well, when we build a dashboard, we build it using sheets. We don't use it, build it using static images. We build it using sheets. Now, I have this dashboard that I want to represent. I can't put a dashboard on a dashboard, but I sure can put a sheet. So I could use, say, just this sheet to represent this dashboard, that sheet right there. And maybe for the second dashboard, I'll use just one of these sheets, right? So what I can do is start to just bring out and I'm not going to lay it out in a nice format. I can just start to bring out these different sheets to represent my dashboards. And I can add titles and I can actually create custom sheets to, to work better for my table of contents. But so now let's assume we have 18 of them out here. How do we click on one of these? You know, these are sheets. They're going to update with our data. How do I click on one of these to actually navigate to the dashboard? Well, that's a little bit of foreshadowing because we're going to talk about um, a little bit more and then we'll get back to this uh, very point. Excuse me for one second. Sorry about that. All right. So next section I'm going to talk about is transparent shapes and images. So. A lot of people hear me say transparent shapes and images, and they have absolutely no clue what I'm talking about. So let's share. I'm going to create a new slide here. Get rid of this garbage. This is just a PowerPoint. I'm going to draw a square. And then I'm going to come up here to shape fill. And I'm going to click no fill. I'm going to go to shape outline, and I'm going to click no outline. So now the shape has disappeared, right? But not really. If I select it, you can see that shape is still here. I can actually right click on this, choose save as, and I can save this as an image. And then I can use that in my shapes repository, or I can use it as an image in my dashboard. And we'll get to both of those different use cases. So what good is a invisible shape? Well, it has all kinds of cool applications. This is something I use in every single dashboard that I work with. 
probably a half dozen times in every dashboard that I work with. So let's start with a really simple use case and we'll kind of build on this. So a lot of times I'll build uh, just these sort of um, table of dimensions, just a, a sort of hierarchy of category, subcategory, manufacturer. And when we do that, if we don't have a measure on, on the view, we're gonna have this sort of weird ABC thing, right? So how do we get rid of that ABC? I always used to do is just change it to a polygon. Boom, it's gone, right? Really cool. The problem with that is polygons don't animate. If you want to use any sort of animations or animated transitions in, in your dashboards, if you have a polygon, anything using a polygon, your whole dashboard's not going to animate. So I don't like that. So the next thing I like to do is, you know, maybe we'll put something on the text card. We'll just do an inline calculation of quote, quote. We'll throw that on the text card. All right, that made it disappear. Well, it shows in the tooltip. I mean, we can get rid of that. And I have this weird selection that Ken kind of talked about before with his bands. So let's scrap that idea. Maybe we'll make it a circle and maybe we'll just make it really small and you still kind of see it. And maybe we just turn the opacity all the way down. And then we still have this weird, like I can pick this. It just, honestly, it's just this kind of weird experience. So the best thing that I like to do is change this to a shape. Then I've loaded in a transparent shape into my shapes repository and I got it at the top because I use it so often. I click on that. It's gone. It's not in the tooltip. And guess what? I can't even select it. So this is a really, really clean approach to getting rid of the ABC. Now, maybe we don't do that a lot. Maybe that's not that big of a deal to you, but there are lots of use cases where it is a big deal. So here's a chart that I create very often at work. Um, we really tend, we use it in marketing pieces a lot. And what we, what we try to do is just isolate one percentage. So this is kind of a model that we're, we're, we're where we expect at 30% of our accounts that we get 30% of our profit. That's kind of randomly, but we have this model that helps us improve upon that, where we can get say 47% of the profit on the 30% on 30% of our accounts. So how might we create a chart like this? It's not really that complicated. We start off with a line chart and, a, and in circles on a dual axis. And then we might create a calculation that says, um, you know, maybe we'll pick that 30% and we'll say, if the percentage of accounts equals 0.3, then give me the sum of profit. And then I take this and I drag it up here and I use that as my uh, dual axis. You know what? We don't need to do any of that stuff. We don't need a calculation. We don't need a, we don't need a calculation at all. All we have to do is take the secondary axis, that's a circle, change it to a shape. Then I'm gonna drag this percentage of accounts onto shape, okay? Nothing has happened yet, but now I have this circle shape associated with all these things. All I gotta do is select them all and make them, except the 0.3, make them transparent, boom. I can do this with a parameter. I can do this really, really easily. And I didn't even need to create a calculation to do it. We can do this if we want to um, just isolate the last point on a chart. Sometimes I do that just to kind of call out that last point. I don't think we need these circles on every single mark. Um, so maybe we would do something similar like um, if we were doing this kind of manually, this big long calculation that says if the order date equals the fixed max of the order date, then give me this. I like to like keep things simple and if the order date equals the fixed maxi order date, basically what's the last date in here? And then we'll change this to a shape. I'll drop that onto shape. You're going to see we're going to get a true false here. We're going to change the true to a circle and the false to a transparent shape, I think. And we've got this where we just called out the last point. So really easy technique of taking these these somewhat complicated calculations and, and different pills on your dual axis and just and just making it really, really easy. Now, Ken mentioned this before. That is so weird. <laughs> I've had lots of customers, you know, years ago when I didn't know how to fix this. So Ken, you know, did a little foreshadowing. I do know how to fix this. Uh, I, I used to have customers say, "What? what's happening? What did I do wrong? Like I clicked on this blue in this thing and it became blue. And, you know, some people, People uh, advocate just, you know, putting a blank over top of it so they can't can't interact. But most of the time I want my customers to interact. That's what Tableau is so great 
um, that I can allow them to interact with the visualization. So I want them to be able to click, but I don't want them to be confused when this thing happens. So, um, spoiler, we can fix that. So you can see if I go to the, the sheet, it's still doing this at a just bigger scale. What I can do, change this to a shape. You probably already figured out what I'm gonna do here. Change it to a transparent shape. And when I click on this, now you see what happens. I don't have that big blue square. It does highlight the number. I think that's great if you're interacting with it, uh, but you don't have that big crazy blue square. So I learned that from Josh Tapley. Um, what a great tip. This one's from Luke Stanky. He was looking at um, sales by year, but then comparing them in a rank um, to last year. So for example, phones, <clears throat> It was number two last year and number one this year. It moved up one spot. We have chairs. It was number one last year. It's number two now. It moved down one spot. Binders moved up three spots. And then we have storage. Well, nothing. It happened. Nothing happened to storage. So how we make this a little bit easier for our customers to understand the blue and red. Okay, we kind of get up and down, but it'd be nice if we could make this a little bit easier. So why don't we change this to a shape? And we'll just change, add some arrows here. Maybe some arrows like this. All right, this is really easy to understand. Up one, down one, up three. All right, this is for zero. What do we do for zero? Let's just change it to a transparent shape, really simple. So now we have this really easy to understand chart. Up one, down one, up three, and this one stayed the same. Now, so far, that's just been transparent shapes. Things were taking this transparent um, image and we're loading it into our shapes repository. But there's also some really cool use cases for transparent images, right? So if we were to type out a, an entire URL, like I've done here, going to Wikipedia, it will turn into a hyperlink, right? Okay, we type out the entire thing, it'll go to hyperlink. But we don't typically want to do that. How often do you see that on a web page where they list out the whole entire URL? What you really want is some sort of text that's just highlighted in blue here, right? I want to be able to click on Tableau software and it go to the website. Well, you can't really do that. You can't right click and add a hyperlink like you can in a Word document or on a web page, um, but you can trick it. So what we can do here is just edit the text. I've just edited the text, made it underlined and made it blue. And then I'm going to add an image here. I'm going to float it over the top. I've copied that URL and I'm going to paste it in the window that says URL opened when the image is clicked. And then you can pretty much guess what I'm going to do, like I've done so many times, is go pick a transparent image. Got a couple of them there and kind of size that up. Now what you can see is I've got this as a hyperlink. If I click on it, I'm going to go to that website. So. And the nice thing is, since it's transparent, if I put this into a full screen mode, there's nothing that the user can see. There's no square floating on top of this. It just looks like a normal old hyperlink that they're used to. So cool little technique for, use, for um, using transparent images versus using transparent shapes. Now we talked about a dynamic table of contents before. I talked about how I can drag these different sheets to represent different dashboards onto my view. But how do I click on one of these sheets to actually go to that actual dashboard? Well, we can use the same trick, same general trick. I can drag a navigation board, uh, navigation button onto my view. And let's size this up to cover this sheet. Then I'm going to come and edit this. I'm going to tell it to go to, I can label this as page one. I'm going to pick, guess what? A transparent image. Okay. Now, if I put this in full screen mode, you can see I've got the sheet. It's going to update with our data dynamically. And if I click on it, because it has a navigation button on top of it, it's going to go to that actual dashboard. So we can set this up, and we've done this at work a dozen times, where we have these dynamic sheets on our dashboard, just like any other dashboard. And you can turn it into a really cool uh, uh, table of contents using uh, navigation buttons, and uh, transparent navigation buttons. Uh, if you go to that link that I mentioned earlier today, you will see that this blog post that I wrote, 14 Uses for Transparent Shapes and Images, you'll see a link to that. Um, and this is kind of the landing page that I use. I have an example visualization on Table of Public, and this is the landing page I use. I wanted to really kind of 
cool looking hex hex layout and i could have hit and made this a button and this button and this button but i just drew the whole thing as a background image and then i just overlaid buttons you can kind of see these buttons here i just overlaid a bunch of transparent shapes so in my transparent shapes visualization i use a bunch of transparent shapes for the the table of contents so kind of what you just saw before like to use lots of uh you know user make the make the um uh interacting with the visualization really really easy for a user so i like to use buttons i often use buttons rather than drop down menus or filters so this is looking at sales for a period of a year and i allow the user to click on 2016 or 2017 to filter it and um this is using parameter actions and the problem I see, and maybe you noticed it as well, is when I click on these buttons, I get this really odd looking outline and it's just kind of a weird user experience that I really don't like. So we can fix this using transparent shapes. There's other ways to fix this, by the way, but a really low, um, a really simple one is uh, using transparent shapes. What I've done is I've left these, these buttons uh, in the background That'll will that'll change when these these uh, this parameter changes, but then I floated another sheet on top of it, and what I have is four buttons here, but the buttons are transparent. There's still a 2016 button, a 2017, an 18, and 19 button, but you can't see them. And you remember, since I can't select that button, you sh when I showed you before, I can click it, but it doesn't show the selection. So if I click this. That parameter action still happens and that highlight highlights this button that's behind but you don't get that sort of weird selection like this it's just a much cleaner look um, much cleaner much better user interface for your users um, a couple of years ago i wrote a blog post called no polygons that uses a transparent shape ken i think that's it for now um happy to take questions if anybody has them and uh yeah thanks for having us wow those are all the great tips i have been getting from customers uh, i just remember uh the other day that the customer told me oh Fifi, why my viewers doesn't and don't understand the dashboard we have created so those are the great techniques to to help the your user to improve or increase the interactions with your dashboards do use it and then yeah adapt all the all the techniques. We have many questions actually. So uh, we have questions that are coming from chat on, and also from the Q&A as well. Um, so one of them asks, thanks for sharing, uh, Ken and Kenny, uh, Kevin. It's really cool sharing. Those tricks are quite useful uh, when we are dealing with, uh, with users. So they would like to um, understand how many, how much time do you spend to maintain those workbooks and also those tricks and how do you yeah. balance your the, the customization and maintenance effort yeah that's a good question i mean um i find that you're not gonna we i find that we're going back and we're maintaining dashboards that are very simple ones that are complicated right so I think in any business, you're going to have some level of, of maintenance. Things are going to break over time. You're going to have changes in data, things that you're not expecting, right? So um, it, if, you're, um, if you're good at, at, at um, commenting your calculations, if you're good at making uh, sure other no uh, users understand some of these techniques that you're using, I think you're, you're not going to have too many issues. Um, Sure. I mean, if, if you're doing things that are more complicated than other users are, um, you know, comfortable with, then then you might have some issues. But I haven't. I haven't we don't have. We're, I don't work for a big company, so we have a small knit of uh, Tableau developers that uh, a small group of Tableau developers, and we've tried to keep each other educated on the techniques we're using, so that if some, one of them has to go edit another person's workbook, they can usually figure it out. But um, I like to use captions in my workbooks, um, not only commenting calculations, but I like to use uh, captions as well to kind of explain to someone what's being used. But I don't know, Ken, you have any comments on that? No, I mean, it, it is a good point. Um, 
because it does create a little bit more maintenance when you're doing these things. But I think, you know, the, the user, your users are used to using websites, you know, and, and apps and these things are all built to have this really good user interface, right? This user experience. Um, and when they, when they come to something that is clunky or doesn't have that sort of smooth user experience, it, they leave it with, you know, they can sometimes leave it with, with negative thoughts, right? So I'm, I'm big on creating that sort of user experience that makes them feel like they're using a professionally built app or website. And, um, I, I think it's worth a little bit of ever, extra effort to, um, to, to build that in and maintain it um, because of the experience, it, it's gonna cause those people to come back um, the next time. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's worth it. Um, and I think using, using some of the techniques that Kevin mentioned of just making sure that you have nice, clean workbooks, well-organized, well-commented, um, those things make it easier to maintain in, in the long run. Oh, thank you. So, so what is your suggestion? Oh, this is the question from me. So what is your suggestion if you have um, a big group of users? Um, they may be a mix of creator and also the uh, explorers of viewers, but you only have maybe one or two um, experts within the organization to, to train uh, the rest of users. So what is your um, suggestions maybe how to um, how the, the one or two experts can efficiently to transfer their knowledges to those users. Um, and especially for the dashboard designing or uh, the other techniques or tips and tricks. I don't know that I have any, yeah, I don't know <laughs> that I have any great insights just because I, I that is not my normal um, job, you know, like I said, we have a, a small group, but, um, I mean, I, I think the things we touched on are very, very important, you know, commenting calculations and being very deliberate about it. I mean, don't just say this is get to get the max month. This, say you're getting the max month and for what purpose? Where are you using it? Why are you doing it? Um, sometimes my, my comments and my calculations are 10 lines long, right? I mean, I try to be very, very clear in what's happening. Sure, it takes a little bit more time. Um, and again, you know, using captions is really, really powerful. Not just the standard caption I'm, that's theirs, but, but to really explain what's happening and the, and the techniques that are being used. Obviously, you know, you're if you have that kind of a group, you're going to need to spend a lot of time training folks and getting people up to speed. Um, I think that, you know, internal Tableau user groups are great. I think things like what we're doing right now are, are great. I think they should be, I think generally um, being involved with the community of, of users, um, whether that's on LinkedIn or on Tableau Public or whatever, is, is way more powerful than most companies will, will um, realize. Um, so, um, you know, for, for our internal team, we, we really, we really encourage people to be involved, um, you know, on Tableau public on, on all the different social media sites, because they're exposed to those kinds of things. Um, we want people to join Tableau user groups in totally different cities and, or to go to local Tableau user groups when they're in person, hopefully they're in person again. So, um, so I really think it just comes down to opening up opening up somebody's ability to uh, you know, allowing them to be engaged and see these things being used and see these different techniques um, that, you know, you wouldn't if you're just kind of doing this in, in business in a silo. So um, I don't know if that's the best answer, but um, at least from my perspective, if I were in a big company, uh, those would be the pieces of advice that I would at least start with. That's yep. very good suggestion. Yeah. Um, so there is another question for Kevin. Um, could you just explain more data fam technique? Uh, the the map finder is quite useful. Yeah. So I, I maybe I will move through that a little quickly. And and Ken it did um, kind of throw a um, a link there of, of something that he wrote. But mm -hmm. generally, when you're working with any chart, 
and you want to interact with that chart, you interact with a mark. You inter you click a bar chart. You click a a dot or a circle in a scatter plot, right? You you click something. You don't just click open space, right? Clicking open space does nothing. So with the map, what I needed to do, you know, so lots. Of, maybe I should show it again, but let me just share my screen again. And like I said, uh, Ken, Ken has a blog. Ken, I wrote a brief blog post on that, and Ken uh, wrote um, uh, some information, of, uh, a blog post about parameter actions that uses a very, very similar technique. So he linked to it there. So how about color? How uh, was the tips and your guidance um, when they choose color, the best practices of choosing color? Hmm. Um, oh, a couple of different things. Sorry, Ken, I'm just going to answer all the questions you don't care. Go for you it. Can jump in. <laughs> uh, first and foremost um, is designing for colorblindness. I think that's the first thing that I really focus on. Uh, there, I think it's some, something close to 10% of the male population is colorblind. And we all have kind of, like for me, I grew up in the Excel world where I was used to doing the stoplight colors, red, yellow, and, or red, orange, and, and green. And my dad's colorblind. He cannot tell the difference between red and green, um, which always seems dangerous to drive. I mean, whatever. Um, so uh, you can't, he can't tell the difference between red and green. So using these red and green color palettes is really uh, problematic at times. And it's not just red and green, it's things like dark brown and red. Those are really hard to, to, to uh, decipher. So there are different sites. I think there's one called Coblis, C-O-B-L-I-S. You could just search for Coblis Colorblind Simulator, where you can uh, export an image of your dashboard, you can upload it to that website and it'll it'll do a colorblind simulation uh, to see how, if it passes. You can tell if those reds and those greens or those browns and those reds look very similar. Uh, I have a, actually have a blog post on our website called uh, Simple Steps for Better Design that really digs into some of those aspects of, of color. Um, aside from that, if it's, if you're designing for colorblindness, I think that's really the, the major best practice. Um, I always like to start off it with, a, with a black and white dashboard and add color as it's needed. I try not to have too much color. If I can use only one color in my dashboard, I will. Um, a lot of times what you'll see is somebody using a color for good and a color for bad, like Tableau defaults to blue and orange. Um, blue is kind of good and, and, and orange is bad. I like to, if I can, even remove the blue. Um, and I'll tend to use, you know, if something is is exceeding the target, I'll tend to just use a gray. And that's the way it's supposed to be. You should be exceeding the target, use a gray. And if you really want to call something out, that's when you use color. That's when you use your red. That's when things are going to pop out is, hey, everything's gray on this dashboard except for these three values that are red. And that tell, that really shows somebody quickly and easily where the problem areas are. Um, so there's a, a few little tips. Um, I, reduce the color if you can. Don't use a lot of them and make sure you're, you're uh, designing for color um, deficiency. Uh, I, sh I would also recommend, uh, you know, we have um, on our website, again, Ken, Ken put together a bunch of different cool uh, fam, uh, um, we call it, the, what do you call it, Ken? The data fam uh, data generated, uh, yeah. what's that? Data fam ba colors. Basically uh, uh, hundreds of color palettes that were developed by community, Tableau community members and they've uploaded it. So you can you can go download those and get lots of different color options, uh, lots of colorblind friendly options as well. I just sent in the chat. Oh, perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're on it. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> okay. Any anybody have any other questions? It's very, very useful sharing. Thank you. And for Ken was helping uh, us to answer the questions in QA window. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good job, Ken. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm sorry again, not allowed to show your face. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, no next problem. time we'll figure this out. Our pictures at least, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh yeah, so somebody said, uh, yeah, in the Q&A, thanks for sharing those are grateful um, tips, yeah. Thank you. Mm. So if there is no more question, I think we'll be ending this sharing uh, soon. I will be sharing, I will be sending all the recording videos to all of attendees so you can share those best practices generously to the users. And uh, I will be uploading to YouTube and for customer, for, for the users, they don't have YouTube access. Uh, there is another um, site you can, you can access to, which is BDBD BD, um, for China users. Well, very good. Thanks for having us. Thank yes, you thank very you so much. much. We appreciate really it. wish you can come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in person. You know, right? in person I, think this is the, <laughs> I think this is the third third time I presented for you. So we'll, we'll make it a fourth second time. Second time. Yeah. Second, second time. Let's make the, the second? third time. Yes. All right. We'll make it the third. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you I thought presented. I did it two other. All right. <laughs> Let's All right. make it the third time. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. And have a good night, uh, Ken and Kevin. Speedy recovery for you, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.